You are listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Well, happy Tuesday, folks. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my program, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. And that's ODYSY1.com. And you can listen to and watch the video live stream over simulcast on my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And you can join in the chat room there where the rest of the Intrepid family likes to come and chat during the show. So come on in and add your piece to the mix over there. And uh, I will admit, I am on a low ebb this evening. My mind just has not clicked in all day. And it's one of those days. So if I fumble around or say things wrong, or like even this show, you know, um, um, coming in here and, and uh, trying to see, I'm doing it right now. So there you go, folks. I'm on a low ebb tonight. So uh, bear with me. But I think that you'll enjoy the information. And uh, you know what? I want to make sure I'm giving you what you want to hear. Now, from the feedback I do get, which comes from a lot of people over in the Intrepid family over on the YouTube channel, uh, you can give me your feedback, too. Just uh, email me at scottallenroberts at gmail.com or uh, come on over to my website, scottallenroberts.com. And you can find a hundred different ways there to contact me. Well, I'm exaggerating. Less than a hundred, but more than two. So, mmm, coffee makes the world go round. Makes my head not spin. So, um, I want to know what you're thinking of what you hear. Uh, If you're okay with it, you don't have to say nothing. If you want to see some different topics discussed, have some ideas. I get ideas thrown at me all the time. And so just go ahead and uh, shoot me a message of some kind. Let me know what you're thinking. Now this stuff, as you know, because we recap it every day, we're talking about Christopaganism. Now, people might say, why have you pulled those two things out of the air to discuss? Well, first of all, I discuss Christianity because the overt majority of us here, those of us here listening, Those of us in America, um, Christianity is how we were either raised or what we were raised around or this Christianized idea of what America was supposed to be from its founding and up. Uh, there, There is a certain Christianity that gets followed. And so most people are familiar with that. Most people grew up with that. Now, I know times are a change and 20 years from now it might be different with another generation out there. However, looking at Christianity on a deeper level, we've got to ask ourselves what is true and what is not true, what is real and what is not real, what is historical, what is fiction, what is, and, and by the way, I'm going to tell all you people that are out there that go, oh, the whole Bible is fiction, it's just a work of fiction, I don't yeah, that's bullshit, so uh, uh, that's not true all by itself, uh, the whole Bible is not just fiction. Uh, you have a lot of, ver- uh, of, of uh, I was going to say voracious, it's not the word I'm looking for, uh, efficacious, there it is, history, in the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There's a lot of great historical information. At the same time, there's a lot of great cultural information and traditional information. There is a lot of great spiritual information. The questions I have is where it comes at at founding a religion, what was taken from other religions that existed already for centuries in that area of the world when uh, these things were all written down. Uh, What is the true religion? Is there one? Uh, The Bible claims it is one in and of itself. Its followers claim that. That's worthy of study and research. As far as history and archaeology, uh, you can't really throw too many stones at the uh, archaeology and history of the Bible. 
Uh, there have been so many things in the Old Testament and the New Testament that have found historical and archaeological veracity that you can't say the Bible is not a historical book. Now, the one thing that's left out is interpreting the spiritual message of the Bible, um, appropriating that theology of the Bible. That is kind of what's up in the air, and that's really what we're trying to look at. It affects the his history affects that uh, that question, but we're looking to see is there anything there that stands out as being the actual 100% proof that this is real. And so those are the things, I'm that's putting it in very simplistic terms, but I think you get it. So that's why I'm looking at Christianity. Paganism, I look at because it is what has been here all the time. And it seems everything else kind of shoots out of paganism in one form or another. You can go to the Far East and look at Shintoism and Buddhism and uh, religions like that. Uh, philosophies like that and they all have to a certain extent a pagan root to them and so that's why I'm looking into this and then we ask the question are they compatible is Western Christianity compatible with paganism I kind of leave Islam out of there because I put that all into the the Abrahamic texts the Abrahamic religions and uh, um, so for practical purposes. And because my mind is fuzzy today, I'm not even going to go there and try to start explaining it off the top of my head. We'll hit that in another time. But right now, I want to dig back into the things that we left off talking about yesterday. And those things uh, are talking about uh, all this stuff, that inexhaustible reserve. I started talking about what the hell did I mean by that? And what were these things that had to do with with uh, setting the stage for this inexhaustible reserve. The mystery religions and Christianity is kind of the main header of where we are right now. And so I want, to, want us to jump right back into that. Let's talk about what I mentioned yesterday as this inexhaustible reserve that we have to fall back on or that we have to look at. And the non-historical body of research that examines the content of ancient religions in order to explore their impact on the development of Christianity is what I'm referring to as the inexhaustible reserve. Uh, most of the researchers in this area have come to the conclusion that Christian mythos is directly borrowed from its pagan neighbors. It's not based in historical events. And that's, that's kind of sad when you think about it because I used to believe, maybe you believe, and a lot of people believe in Christianity and believe in the stories of the Christian New Testament. And yet we find that many of those stories kind of match other stories that came long before them. And so Christianity, in trying to lend more veracity to its God-man, Jesus, um, they have taken him and his story and expanded on it by adding so many elements from paganism uh, that it would make your head spin, and hopefully it already has started making your head spin. That's, that's such a cliche. I don't know why I use that there, make your head spin. Uh, there's so many examples out there that it can't be denied, is my question. You can deny it if you want. You can deny it on a, a faith basis. Well, this is what I believe, and I believe what you're presenting me is wrong. You can believe that if you want. If that's in your heart of hearts, believe that. But what I'm asking you to do is to ask yourself why you believe what you believe. There's that question again. Why do you believe it? Because somebody told you so? Because you want to believe it? Because you shape God to fit your belief system rather than believe what God or what spirituality really is and really is all about? So occasionally this histo these historical figures we talked about yesterday show up in the Jesus story. <clears throat> Excuse me, they show up in the biblical stories. They show up in these theologically based stories, these faith stories that are wrapped around historical events. <clears throat> we mentioned Pontius Pilate yesterday, the prefect of Judea in the Jesus story, the one who could have set Jesus free. He says, uh, whom will you have, Jesus or Barabbas? 
that pilot washed his hands of it all. So all of these things, all these different historical peoples are sometimes added to the story to bring veracity to the story. According to the scholars out there that study all this stuff, Jesus did not exist as a historical person, nor did John the Baptist, Mary and Joseph, or the disciples. And as I said yesterday, I don't believe that. I believe he existed. I believe there's plenty of information available to us to say the man existed. Um, you can't start a religion that lasts for 2,000 years on a fiction, on a complete fiction. I believe there was at the core a man named Jesus of Nazareth. I believe uh, all the things about him that people say, a good teacher, a prophet, he may have been the Son of God. He may be divine. I don't know this for sure. But what I'm telling you is that the pagan world around, Christi, early Christians adopted the pagan world around them to fit the story of Jesus to elevate him to the same God-man status as all these other God-men in history. And so, um, it's been pointed out by a lot of these scholars that do this stuff, uh, that research this stuff, that most religions are based on a story or a divine heroic. It's a heroic figure who goes into a lower world uh, uh, literally by incarnating himself into a body. God became flesh to dwell among us, Jesus, uh, as Christianity states. That God impregnated a young woman um, uh, because he owned her. He's God. He owns everybody. He can do whatever the hell he wants, apparently. So he impregnated this woman. Now, she was overjoyed, according to the story, because she was going to bear the Messiah for her people. And uh, then uh, this God-man dies. Uh, that was the, the case of Jesus. In all the other stories, the God-man performs miraculous deeds, has victories over enemies, uh, suffers, dies, rises again, and returns to his native upper world, up in the heavens or wherever it is, and then celebrates his triumph while being enthroned on high. And while the pagan stories were treated as symbolic, all these God men, it was symbolic, the Christian story quickly lost that whole symbolic uh, 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 outer coating around it. And it treated its mythos as historical fact and making Jesus into an historical figure. And now I'm not saying making him exist in history, I'm saying making his mythological parts that were added to, uh, rather than be symbolic, they made that the actual history of who he was. And so, um, this is kind of a preposterous claim when you think about it, uh, for any scholar to make, for anyone to make, especially in light of the centuries of teachings by the church and the seamless history that Christian scripture portrays. What kind of people would make such outrageous claims about somebody when those things didn't really exist or didn't really happen. Um, when you review all this stuff, you start seeing a wide range of people from ardent free thinkers and humanists to those who are neutral about religion, those who are fervent Christians, those who are strongly Christian, uh, uh, who, who definitely struggle with the evidence and the conclusions, but they seem to prefer the struggle, as we mentioned yesterday, they prefer the struggle over being at ease in their faith, while ignorant of the evidence, not having evidence in hand. I believe this about Jesus in Christianity because I want to, I choose to, it has to be so. Uh, don't give me the evidence, don't show me the facts, that's just man's uh, Satan messing with mankind, is the excuse you get. So, while this material could be presented in a, in a number of ways, uh, such as by culture or deity, um, I want to treat it this way. Let's look at this story as it relates to Jesus. Let's look at these things now. 
The virgin birth. Now, we've covered the virgin birth. We talked about the virgin birth already. But let's look at it from this specific angle now. Uh, this uh, inexhaustible reserve, so to speak. Now, keep that in mind as we go through this. Many mystery religions that existed in the regions surrounding first century Palestine included a miraculous virgin birth. A lot of these god-men were born of virgins in all of these older mythological tales of god-men. In Asia Minor, Artis is born of the virgin Sibyl. In Alexandria, Aeon is born of the virgin Kor. In ancient Egypt, Neith brought forth the sun god, Ra, without a male partner. And in Greece, Dionysus' mother is Simeel, who is impregnated by a lightning bolt from Zeus. <laughs> That's what I told my wife. I said, three times, you got struck with the lightning bolt, baby. And of course, my ex-wife, uh, three other ones. So I've got six children, six lightning in a bottles. Hmm. You can call it whatever euphemism you want. There it is. So Jesus is born the same way. He's born of a virgin, impregnated by God. The Holy Spirit sent from God gave her a baby. And she didn't ask for that baby. Uh, God didn't ask her if she wanted it. Um, this was something that was done to her. So Mithras, Dionysus, Adonis, they all celebrate their birthdays on what day? December 25th, along with Jesus. Now, I don't think that Jesus was born on December 25th, but this is the date that the Orthodox Church used to appropriate to Jesus, at least the foundings of the Orthodox Church, what became the Orthodox Church, because they wanted to tie Jesus in with the gods that already existed before him, the god-men. So they gave him the December 21st, 25th birth. And by the way, in, quas in case you're, uh, you're wondering, and I think I've talked about this before in greater detail, but there are reasons to believe that Jesus of Nazareth would have been born in April. If you look at the facts in the story, it says that the shepherds were in close enough to Bethlehem to come visit him the night of his birth. Now, if they were in that close with their flocks, that means they didn't have them out in the distant pastures, which would have taken a day's journey to get to and back. What it meant was they were in close enough, and there's only one time of the year that that happens. That's for Passover. They bring all the flocks of sheep in so people can start making their purchase of a lamb to sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem for Passover. And so they were in close and uh, um, to the city of Bethlehem, which means it was probably around April, late March, early April, somewhere in that time period. So Jesus, that's when he would have been born, uh, that time of year, if the you start looking at things like that, the historical facts around it. So um, the ancient Ga uh, Greek historian um, Plutarch, he noted that the birth of the younger Horus in Egypt, as opposed to the elder Horus, was celebrated at the winter solstice. And mythologist Joseph Campbell, whose book I was thinking about uh, as we were talking here, the, the Hero of a Thousand Faces, is a good one of his good works to pick up. It's a classic. Uh, Campbell notes that in, in those times, the winter solstice was observed on December 25th. So uh, St. Justin Martyr quotes an unidentified ancient Syrian commentator who wrote that it was in fact customary among the pagans to celebrate the festival of the sun's birthday, S-U-N, the sun's birthday, on the 25th of December, and to light bonfires in honor of the day. They even used to invite the Christian population to these rites. Join in with us, celebrate! But when the teachers of the church realized that the Christians were allowing themselves to take part, they decided to observe the Feast of the True Birth on the same day. So, you know what? Uh, we don't want you celebrating with those pagans the birth of false gods, so we're going to make our gods God-man's birthday on the same day. So you can come and celebrate Christmas with us. 
And uh, so regarding the role that the veneration of the sun, S-U-N, played in Christianity, um, it's observed that until the 5th or 6th century A.D., Christians addressed their deity as our Lord, the sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N. But in later centuries, it was changed to our Lord, the God. So in the 2nd century, Tertullian remarked, you pagans say we worship the sun. Well, so do you. So, uh, it's interesting stuff. Uh, Isis, the mother of Horus, is frequently shown with Horus sitting on her lap. And uh, so greatly do some of these images resemble Jesus and Mary that some statues of the Black Virgin, which were venerated in France during the Middle Ages, were later shown to be statues of Isis, made from basalt. Isis and Horus were not the only Madonna and child portrayed in art. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, this is Mary, and that's a statue of Mary and Jesus. Well, in actuality, they find out later it's a statue of Isis and Horus. And so, uh, um, uh, Babylon had their fertility goddess. And I lost my place in my, in my head and everything. Babylon, uh, 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 an example of all this, of the statuary, came from Babylon, of the fertility goddess uh, Mylita and her son Tammuz, the god of vegetation. Remember, Rocky and I talked about the god Min and salad and stuff like that, uh, lettuce. So this was the god of vegetation. Uh, titles were given to Isis to include Our Lady, Star of the Sea, Queen of Heaven, Governess, Mother of God. That sound familiar? Intercessor, an Immaculate Virgin. Those titles sound familiar to you? We're talking about Isis here, Mother of Horus. So any Catholic is going to recognize these titles as belonging to who? Mary, the mother of Jesus, the wife of Joseph. Um, and Isis was shown standing on a crescent moon with 12 stars surrounding her head, an image frequently used for Mary, the mother of Jesus. And there's a similar version of this is, that's shown in the image of Juno, uh, the queen of heaven. And so the question of the genealogy of Jesus provides a good example of how a historical event may have been blended with the story of all these other gods. Uh, Kuhn states that there were references in the Jewish Talmud to a person who lived in 115 BCE by the name of Jehoshua ben Pandira, Jehoshua ben Pandira. And according to the Talmud, his birth was accompanied by supernatural manifestations. Later, he traveled to Egypt, where he studied the magical arts, and then returned to Palestine and worked a number of miracles. He aroused the hostility of the Orthodox priesthood, was arrested for the practicing of sorcery, tried and condemned. He was then held for 40 days to see if anyone would speak for his release, and when no one did, he was stoned to death, and his body hung on a tree as an example to others. Uh, that was a, uh, a story that was very well known in the region. Uh, even into the early centuries of uh, the Common Era, when the church father Epiphanus uh, Epiphanius uh, gave Jesus' genealogy as follows. He put it this way. He said, Jacob, called Pandira, Mary, Joseph, Cleopas, then Jesus. In the mid-2nd century, uh, Origen states that, J Origen, uh, uh, st historian states that James, the father of Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, was called Panther, a translation of Pandera, and apparently to explain why Jehoshua, a derivative of Jesus, was called Ben Pandera. So Jehoshua Ben Pandera. And in the Talmudic legend, thus equating Jehoshua and Jesus. In the 5th century, uh, Gregon Tias, Bishop of Africa, states that Jesus was put to death because he was a sorcerer. Again, referring to the legend, in the 8th century, John of Damascus 
gives Mary's genealogy as Jehoiakim, her father, Bar Panther, his father, and Levi before him. So none of these genealogies are found in either Matthew chapter 1 or Luke chapter 3, but then those two genealogies also differ from each other that they can't be reconciled, even in the Gospels in the New Testament. So you're looking at a character that in the Jewish Talmud that has very similar names, very similar deeds, existed. You look at the titles, the Egyptian god Osiris, who accompanied the dead to their resurrection, was called the soul that lives again. And the firstborn of the unformed matter, and the Lord of life for all eternity. The Egyptian god Horus, also involved with the guiding and the resurrecting of the dead, was called Savior. And he's identified in inscriptions as the second emanation of Ammon, the son whom he begat. The Egyptian god Serapis was also called the Savior, as well as Dionysus was called the Savior, who also carried the titles of Slain One, the Sin-Bearer, the Redeemer, the Only Begotten Son. And so the god Attis, whose worship came into Asia Minor from the Phrygians, considered by some historians to be one of the most ancient cultures in the area, was called Savior and Only Begotten Son. Mithras was also called Savior. He was called the Mediator between God and man. All of these titles have been applied to Jesus since the death of Jesus. By the way, that last one, the only mediator between God and man, that one might be a little more obscure for some of you, but in the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, it talks about how Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. He's the one to go to. So you're going to notice the frequent use of of only begotten in connection with several deities <coughs> excuse me um, that we're going to discuss that we discuss in all of these things as we examine them uh, this was a common title in the mystery religions uh, especially of the day and perhaps they were made popular by the Egyptian use of the scarab beetle in the incarnation of certain gods since this beetle was believed to be self-produced, requiring no female, like the beetle, incarnations of gods were also seen as the only begotten or the self-begotten. Uh, many of the, if you look at cartouches of the pharaohs, the famous pharaonic names, many of them had the scarab in the name, so begotten of himself, because they were gods. So, uh, the god Ammon, or Amun, later combined with the god Ra, Amun-Ra, is described as the one who existed from the beginning. None knew his emergence. Uh, think of God. Think of God, Jehovah God, Elohim. Um, never beginning, never ending. Uh, there is no beginning. There is no emergence. He was the eternal God. No God existed before him, no other was with him. Who could tell his form, it said of Amun-Ra. He had no mother, no name, no, uh, no, uh, no mother to name him, I'm sorry. Uh, no father to beget and say, this is I. He shaped his egg for himself. This is all Egyptian mythology. Force, mysteries of birth, creator of his own beauty. God divine one, God divine one, self-created. So the Gospel of John in the New Testament uh, appears uh, to have this uh, drawn the same tradition. In verse one eighteen of John, the writer refers to Christ in some versions. Uh, see the Jerusalem Bible for a notation on this. By the way, you can pick that up. You can look at it online at Bible Gateway. Uh, but as the only begotten God, or God only begotten, the identification or the equation of Jesus with the only begotten Egyptian gods, and then later the only begotten gods of the mystery religions, it was still so well known at the time that even centuries later, 
St. Ambrose calls Jesus the good scarab. A Christian saint, several centuries later, calls Jesus the good scarab, uh, who clung to the cross as a good scarab, and a good scarab shouted from the wood, Lord, do not count this sin against them. Or in other versions, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Huh. St. Ambrose refers to Jesus as the good scarab. John's Gospel gives the title of Logos, L-O-G-O-S, uh, to Christ. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and with the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Uh, the Word, Word being translated as Logos, from Logos. The idea of the Logos was first articulated in the writings of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who lived from 535 to 475 BCE, uh, before the time of Christ. And as used by Heraclitus, uh, lo uh, logos referred to both speech and to reason. The Greek philosopher Zeno described the logos, this great logos, <clears throat> this nebulous unknown that was God. He uh, referred to the logos as the arranger of the universe and the established order of things. Or as Lactantitus said, the spirit of God which he named the soul of Jupiter. The Stoic philosophers believed that certain gods were personifications of the great Logos, the great unknown, this great uh, nebulous mass of God that is out there. In particular, Hermes and Mercury. The Jewish philosopher Philo, Philo you could say, believed the Logos to be a parallel of Sophia, the wisdom of God who acts as a mediator between God and the world. Do you see where all this is going, folks? All these references that we have learned about Christ came from other sources. They came from other gods, other personifications of the great God man that was not birthed, or I'm sorry, not fathered, but where his virgin mother gave birth to him. So Jesus is not unique. And all the titles you see of him were taken from other sources. Now, we got to quit there for the first half of this broadcast because we're up against the break. You sit tight for two minutes or so, or thereabouts, and we'll be back. Hang on.
Well, welcome back, folks. Thanks for sitting through the break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1.com. And you can come and join the simulcast over on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And you can join in the live chat room over there, which is a lot of fun. By the way, later tonight, about uh, two hours after this broadcast starts, an hour after this broadcast ends, I'm going to be on with Rocky Stucci's Situation Room. And that'll be over at Rocky Stucci Media over on YouTube. And you can catch that show an hour after this one ends. We give you an hour buffer in there so you can recover from this show and get hunkered down for that show. So that's coming up yet tonight. And uh, let's jump back into this material. Because there's plenty of it to go through, I want to take some time with this. I want to get there. and Save the jokes, save the levity for the Situation Room a little later. All right, here we go. <coughs> after I clear my throat. <coughs> without a, You'd think after all this time I'd have installed a cough button. I haven't. i got to go through all kinds of machinations here to uh, hit the cough button. So, hang on. Mm. I'm going to wet my whistle there. By the way, let me uh, also tell you before we get rolling, I'm an illustrator, I'm a designer. Come over to my page, scottallenroberts.com. See what I'm all about? I design logos, I design... I, I do uh, illustration work, illustration work for children's books. That's the stuff that keeps me busy most of the time. So uh, come on over, take a look. Uh, book cover designs, all kinds of designs related to business, uh, whatever your needs might be. Take a look, scottallenroberts.com. Get a hold of me, and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. All right, let's move on here. Uh, we were talking about all these titles that were ported over and used for Jesus. Now, Make no mistake about this as you're thinking through these things. Jesus didn't hold these titles and somebody else picked them up and used them for the fake gods that are all out there. All of these titles ascribed to Jesus were titles that Jesus' followers picked up from the mystery religions that were all through the region for hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of Jesus, and they ascribed those to him, elevating Jesus to be another one of the God-men types, a symbolic type that fit in with all the other symbolic types they had. And uh, his followers made Jesus a God. This is where it gets confusing for people. Well, I believe Jesus was always God. Wasn't he God? Wasn't he born of a virgin? God was his dad. And, uh, well, I think these are the things that are added. This is the mythology added to the historical Jesus, which was just a guy. And that's hard to wrap your head around, especially if you were taught differently your whole life. And hopefully this series will give you something to latch on to. Now, if you've got a better explanation, I'm open to that. I know there are explanations out there, and we'll probably hit some of those, coming from Christianity as to why none of these names and titles were really stolen or borrowed, why the holidays weren't borrowed, why the whole system of religion wasn't borrowed, why the whole issue of a virgin mother and of a divine savior were not borrowed issues from other gods. The The explanations are out there. Uh, but... Uh, for practical purposes, what you're finding is perhaps something you believe for a very long time in your life, you're finding has a different explanation for it. What does that do to your faith? What are you going to do about that is the big question that's now laid out in front of you. Let's go on with some of these titles. Remember the, the Good Shepherd uh, was a... a, a uh, title given to Jesus. He's the good shepherd. You've seen paintings in kids' bedrooms of Jesus with the little lost lamb over his shoulder. He goes out to save the one lost lamb. He's the good shepherd. 
but this was one shared by several deities of the time, including Horus, Apollo, Mercury. These are gods that came before Jesus was ascribed divinity. Jesus was given the title also, and in early art he's shown carrying a lamb over his shoulders, which is typical for the other deities as well. Mercury often carried a ram over his shoulders, and so was called the ram-bearer. So frequently was Mercury depicted in the role of the Good Shepherd uh, that the art historian Jameson noted that in some instances uh, it led to a difficulty in distinguishing the two. Apollo was also shown as the Good Shepherd in his role of Apollo Agrius or Aristeus, and yet the concept may be even older than those gods, as can be seen in early American Etruscan uh, artwork. Um, you can see all different kinds of art if you look them up. I'm sorry I'm not showing them here. Radio audience wouldn't benefit from that anyway. But there are all sorts of uh, pieces of art that exist way back before the time of Jesus. How's that for a descriptive intellectual term? Way back. It's the way back machine. And sh um, so uh, Jesus is known as the Good Shepherd, but so is Apollo, so is Mercury. So is, uh, a, there's Etruscan art, very simplistic art, pre-Roman, that shows um, a god-man carrying a sheep, a good shepherd. The concept of this one, uh, this is one I've always uh, dealt with with people, uh, or talked about with people, and that's the concept of the Trinity. It was also not unique to Christianity. Many religions have deities with triple aspects, different triune forms, emanations. Neo-pagans uh, can think of several such examples that are familiar to them. To give one example from the Egyptians, we read this. Three are all the gods, Amun, Ra, Ptah. There are none like them. Hidden in his name is, as Amun, he is Ra. His body is Ptah. He is manifested in Amun, with Ra and Ptah, the three united. Ancient Egyptians had a trinity. Just like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus' ministry uh, his, this period of ministry of his life, about three and a half years, they say, officially begins with his baptism in the river, Jordan, by John the Baptist. And mythology scholar Joseph Campbell, again, he notes that the rite of baptism has been traced to ancient Sumeria. We're talking back before Judaism, even. Back during the time of the Anunnaki. And the practices surrounding the water god Ea, Ea, which is the other name for Enki. Uh, Enki, who created primordial man to do the work for the Anunnaki gods. And that was their parallel to the Edenic story. Uh, he is called, en Ea is known as the god of the house of water. Ea's symbol was Capricorn, an animal that's part goat and part fish. And it's his zodiacal sign that in that period of history rises on the horizon at the winter solstice, <clears throat> which was December 25th back then. Uh, during the Hellenistic period, Ea was called Oanes. Have you heard of Oanes, the half-man, half-fish god and his people that would rise up out of the water and teach the early humans the crafts of living? Um, Oanes, in Greek he was uh, Ionis. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, he was Johannan. In Latin, Johannes, or Johannes. And in English, John. So, Oanes, pretty much named John. So, John, the half-god, half-fish man, half-fish, half-man god, uh, John rose up out of the water and taught me things. Where did you learn how to do that, little Zebagadnezer? Why, John, the half-man, half-fish god, showed me. Reminds me of uh, Monty Python, the Holy Grail, the evil wizard name. My name is Tim. Uh, so we have John, who leads the way 
before Jesus, John the Baptist. Owenis. And, uh, and he baptizes. Some scholars believe that John the Baptist and Jesus represent these dual aspects of the solar and the lunar cycles. Um, as one increases, the other decreases. Didn't John the Baptist say that? I must decrease, but he must increase, he says of Jesus. Um, that's in John 30, 3, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease, said John the Baptist. Uh, once again, Joseph Campbell speaks up. He notes that some scholars maintain that there never was a historical John or a Jesus, but that they were instead metaphors for the water god and the sun god. It's possible. I think they were historical people. I do. The people were there. The question is, how much was added to them by the followers? The correspondences with Owenes appear to go further than John the Baptist. Barosus was a 3rd century BCE Chaldean priest. wrote about him in my, my uh, book on the Nephilim. He was a Chaldean priest, and he wrote a three-volume series on the history and culture of Babylonia. In his work, he sets out the myth of Owenes, John and recounts that Owenes would come out of the sea every day, and uh, uh, he would go among men, teaching them wisdom and crafts in the early days. He would eat and drink nothing while with them, and then he'd return to the sea at night, and, uh, and Barosus says this about Owenes. Here's a passage from something Barosus wrote. Uh, he says that... Uh, um, Oanes was accustomed to pass the day among men, but took no food at that season. Oh, just got a little deja vu. wonder what that's from. I wonder if that's from when I wrote this in my first book, way back in 2011 when I was writing it. Maybe I'm getting a little deja vu from that. Something else just hit me. Anyway, and he gave them an insight. Oanes gave the humans an insight into letters and sciences and arts of every kind. He taught them to construct cities, to found temples, to compile laws, and explain to them the principles of geometrical knowledge. He made them distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect the fruits. In short, he instructed them in everything which could tend to soften manners and humanize their lives. From that time, Nothing material has been added by way of improvement to his instructions. And when the sun had set, this being, Oanes, John, retired again into the sea and passed the night in the deep, for he was amphibious, he was mermaidish. And after this there appeared other animals like Oanes. So, in the same manner, Jesus, the ichthys, or the fish, instructs men by day. But at night he often retires to the Lake Galilee or in a boat. Uh, the Gospel of John also tells us that the disciples tried to get Jesus to eat, but he refused at times, saying, I have food to eat you know not of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. That's in John 4. Now that's maybe a little bit of stretching the narrative to fit, but that seems to be a similarity that is there. You know, what I'm thinking of also is in the book of Enoch, where um, it says that the 200 prefects came down from heaven and decided to intermingle with the daughters of humans because they loved any of them they chose. And they taught them the art of, uh, ag of, of, uh, of divining the moon, of healing, of agriculture, of uh, 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 weaponry and metallurgy, all these different things. The same things attributed to Owenes. Only in the book of Enoch, he's talking about the Elohim, those beings that came down and intermingled with the daughters of men, and their children became known as the Nephilim. And so there are other parallels out there. So baptism was a requirement in many mystery religions. Initiates to the mysteries of Isis and Dionysus, uh, they were baptized. 
as were those in the mysteries of Mithras. Zoroastrians, Zoroastrians, took their children to the temple after they were born, and the priest either sprinkled water on the child or immersed the child, dunked the child in the water, uh, in a big vase filled with water, a vase, if you will, if you're a highbrow like that, a vase. Um, after the ceremony, the father named the child. That was also the naming ceremony. And one form of baptism in Mithraism was called the Tarobalium. Say that fast three times. Tarobalium. That's not so bad. T A U R O B O L I U M. Now, what are you supposed to be going to talk about when you think of Taro, T A U R? Uh, you think of, of course, Taurus, the bull. So the Tarobolium was performed by slaughtering a bull on a perforated platform under which the initiate stood in a pit, the blood of the sacrificed bull pouring down on the one to be baptized. And he or she was considered to be washed free of their sins by the blood of the bull. And poorer people who couldn't afford to kill a bull may do with a sheep in a ceremony called the Creobolium, in which the sheep was slaughtered in like fashion. And so in this case, the initiate was liter literally washed in the blood of the lamb. Where have we heard that before? Um, there's an old hymn in Christianity, Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the lamb? And uh, the blood, there was always salvation in the blood. There was always something about the blood. Thou hast saved us by the shedding of the eternal blood. This was an inscription to Mithras. Uh, the last Torah volume was performed in Rome in the late 4th century A.D. on the site that's now occupied by St. Peter's Basilica. I know in, in Christianity we had all sorts of songs about the blood. Um, white as snow. We had a little hymn, uh, not even a hymn. It was a little song. We would sing. It was kind of an in-between song because it wasn't a big song. He would say, "White as snow, white as snow, white as snow." Um, though my sins be as scarlet, Lord, I know, Lord, I know that in you I'm forgiven by the power of your blood. Uh, and I don't remember all the words to it, but uh, by the something, by grace in you, I know that I can be white as snow. And so there was this whole idea in Christianity of the washing away of sins. I can be whiter than snow, uh, metaphorically speaking, by the shed blood of the Savior. <clears throat> David said, in one of his great psalms of prayer, after uh, his affair with Bathsheba, according to the biblical story, and he had her husband murdered in battle, um, and the sin is pointed out to him by the prophet, and he writes that psalm that says, uh, uh, he's talking to God, and he says, against you and you only have I sinned. He says, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, the hyssop was a reference to, remember at the Exodus, the plague of the firstborn? The way that the spirit, the angel of death, was to pass over your house in Egypt that night was to take a branch of hyssop, dip it in sheep's blood, and wipe it across uh, the lintel and the, the posts of the door. And when the angels saw this, he would pass over your house. Hence the term Passover. Um, <clears throat> so the blood has always been connected to salvation. So the number 12, let's move on to that. Number 12 was commonly found in all these neighboring religions. Uh, just as with the 12 disciples of Jesus. Mithras was accompanied by 12 personages who corresponded to the 12 signs of the zodiac in the celebrating you ever think of that just think of that alone 12 disciples 12 signs of the zodiac all the different references in the zodiac that align with jesus 
all the other religions that had 12 in there. So the 12, in the celebration of the mysteries of Mithras, the initiate would be surrounded by 12 people dressed as these zodiacal signs. Um, The 12 was chosen for the number of disciples because it was a mystical number used frequently in both pagan and Jewish religions. Uh, Keep in mind also that uh, at the time when Jacob relocated his family, his little clan of Hebrews, if you will, of Israelites. Jacob, his name was also Israel. So the clan of Israel moved into Egypt. And remember, he had 12 sons. Now each of those sons became the tribe, the heads of the tribes of Israel as Israel grew into a nation. And that still exists today, the 12 tribes. So now here's some examples uh, that are given of uh, of uh, uh, the uh, of this um, miraculous twelve number, uh, the twelve powers of intelligence of the sun god Ra, the twelve signs of the zodiac, which you already mentioned, the twelve dungeons of the soul in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. There's twelve reapers of the golden grain. The twelve rowers of the boats with Horus. The twelve sailors in the ship of Ra. The twelve sons of Jacob. The twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve stones set by Joshua in the riverbed. The twelve pieces of the concubine's body in Judges. The twelve tables of stone. The twelve Urim and Thummim stones on the breastplate of the high priest. You know, that was a bit of magic. We talked about this a couple of times way back. But the Umim and the Thurim in the Jewish temple, they would go to the high priest and he could see what he was divine, what God wanted, what the universe wanted with the stones, the Umim and the Thurim. And then they were set in the breastplate on the priestly garment. Um, Jesus is recorded as performing a number of miracles. The scholars surveyed find parallels from other miracle workers in the region, some of them whom were legendary, and some of them who were historical as well. There's too much material on this topic to even start to cover it in any kind of detail. But here's a few examples. We've already mentioned the Talmudic story of Jehoshua, Jehoshua ben Ben Pandira, who apparently was the historical figure in the 2nd century BCE, Uh, in the Talmud, in Jewish writings, that matched a lot of details about Jesus. Uh, Let's see, that was, and that was in the second century, before Jesus. So, biblical skeptic uh, Joseph Wheelis and others note that many of the men revered as wonder workers in this period were also considered gods, or sons of God. There's a historian, Charles Waite, who quotes St. Basil, is saying, every uncommonly good man was called the Son of God in that era. Names of these uncommonly good men are Apuleius, Alexander, Iamblichus, and Apollonius of Tyana. And the course of Apollonius's life mirrors that of Jesus in many details. Apollonius, Apollonius, he healed the sick. He cast out demons and devils. He prophesied. He raised the dead. He was considered a man of extremely upright character and pure morals. Willis uh, also noted that pagans of the time and some later historians believed that Apollonius was used as a pattern for Jesus when they created Jesus. In 98 of the Common Era, 100 years after the, the birth of Christ or thereabouts, The Roman historian Tacitus recorded stories concerning the miracles of a man named Vespasian, who was born in 10, the year 10 of the Common Era of A.D. In one of them, a blind man came to Vespasian for a cure. Vespasian rubbed his spit on the man's face and eyes, whereupon the man could see again. Tacitus also records Vespasian healing a man who had a withered hand. And some miraculous stories just like these are told of Jesus. 
As a matter of fact, when the blind man came to Jesus and asked to be healed, it says Jesus uh, spit into his hand and picked up some dust to the ground and made a little clay in his hands and, and pushed it into the guy's eyes like a, uh, um, a poultice, a poultice of some type. Then he told him to go wash in the pool, I think of Bethesda. And the man did, and he could see. Um, Jesus also had this, uh, uh, the, the man with the withered hand, that Jesus healed him. So these stories, two exact stories from Vespasius, became stories of the life of Jesus. Did they both do the same thing to people? Was one true and the other not? Were they both mythology? Perhaps the most moving and dramatic of Jesus' miracles is that of raising the dead, Lazarus. And it's got to be noted that each of the scholars that were surveyed for all of these things uh, provides a numerous amount of stories, innumerable almost, amount of stories of other miracle workers who supposedly did the same types of things who supposedly also raised the dead. And uh, this might demonstrate no more than that such stories were just common at that time. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Horus calls to the mummies and he commands them to come forth. And in like matter, Jesus cries, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Um, so uh, there are base, base relief carvings, bas relief carvings, on sarcophagi in the Vatican City, which shows Jesus raising Lazarus. On this carving, Jesus is shown as a beardless young man pointing a wand at Lazarus. And while Lazarus is wrapped as a mummy, Horus frequently uses a wand often shaped like the Ankh, and he raises the dead. And we got to stop there. We're at the end of time. We're actually almost over time. So folks, think about these things. It's interesting stuff. How does this affect the way you believe things? Does it? Let's go out for 23 hours. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll see you then. Have a good rest of your night and a good day tomorrow.